we're going to talk about something that I'm not sure a lot of um, airports, airlines, or in general people um, are already considering or thinking about, because we're going to talk about eVTOLs, about urban air mobility, and about how we, you know, uh, move people around our cities and around the globe. So um, the question that we're going to, um, or that, that we want to shed light on today is, um, if the skies are getting a, about, are about to get a little bit more busier, and um, also what's needed to, you know, take this leap uh, into moving people around our cities. So for that, I'm really excited to welcome a lot of great panelists here on stage with me. Um, before we kick things off, maybe, I want to um, ask a question to every one of you. Because we always talk about sustainability, we talk about green mobility, we talk about the future of aviation, but what does this actually mean to you and to your organizations? So how do you define green mobility um, when it comes to aviation, maybe, or in general? And what do you think aviation will look like in the next 20 years? Maybe, Anna, we can start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, we can connect there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, for us, it's uh, now that we see that travel is on the rise again, the, the crisis is moving backwards, we see a lot of focus and a lot of pressure on the topic of green mobility and green aviation. Um, we have a lot of um, regulatory um, challenges coming up, so we see on the, on the European legislation, uh, we see there is the Green Deal. Um, so the cost of, of carbon emission will rise a lot. Um, and we as Austrian Airlines and as Lufthansa Group, um, we of course um, investing a lot in how to make um, our business model as it already exists more sustainable. Um, and there is methods to do it um, with, with more efficient aircraft, with sustainable aviation fuel. Um, but of course it requires large, large investments. And money is something the aviation industry does not really have at the moment. <laughs> um, so I think um, the investment part and also the availability um, of, of sustainable uh, technologies will be one of the big challenges for the future, um, be it innovative aircraft um, and new, new aircraft technologies and sustainable aviation fuel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Andreas. Um, at FSCC, uh, how do you define that? Well, thank you very much, first of all, for being here. Um, great to be always at uh, um, Vienna Airport, especially with such amazing events and, and guests. Um, since we are among the top 15 of the global aerospace supply chain, I guess my role is to speak also about uh, technology a bit. Um, what we can see in this whole discussion is that aviation industry is in the epicenter of, of, or in the center of gravity of the whole sustainability discussion, at least this is my perception in the whole public debate. And um, if it's, if it's um, based on facts or if it's more based on, on let's say, some, some, some good lobbying, uh, that's a different discussion, but nevertheless, we have a huge responsibility. And I think one thing is clear, nobody in the aerospace industry is trying um, to, to push this responsibility away. And I think in, in the future, moving forward, each mobility industry, no matter if it's on the ground or up in the air, has to be efficient, has to be seamless, and has to be sustainable. Of course, in our, in our area, we have technological limitations, and here it depends a lot about what kind of aircraft, what kind of uh, transport we're talking about. And uh, speaking about uh, e-mobility, for example, what is, what is the main topic on the ground in, in, in these days? Uh, there is a huge potential in smaller aircraft, in the area of business jets, in the area of private aircraft, um, whereas in the large-scale uh, um, passenger aircraft segment, uh, this is totally out of reach. Yeah? So here we have technological limitations. Uh, the topics are more about propulsion systems, more about uh, e-fuels, where uh, we have technologies existing today, but are they affordable? Um, can you build a business case based on that? I'm not 100% sure. At the same time, we don't have a, a proper alternative uh, to, to uh, intercontinental traveling because um, going by, by ship uh, or by train is not possible, not very efficient, as we saw uh, through very good uh, public examples also. Um, so uh, 
what what is our our duty as an as an industry as a whole? You know, I think we need to bring much more facts into that discussion because right now the debate is flying or not flying. You have words like flag shaming and things like that. Um, I think we need to push the debate in a direction where we say flying, but how can we fly differently? You know. Yeah. And uh, here we need uh, an emphasis on, here we need uh, also a political support. Uh, we can speak about new taxations, for example, but let's reinvest them in uh, 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 inventing and improving technologies which make flying more sustainable, because not flying is not an option if we want to continue being in a globalized world. That is true. Um, Daniel, Munich uh, Airport, what's your take on, on the aviation industry in the next 20 years? What's your take on Maybe sustainable aviation fuels. We heard about that. Is this a next? This is a step that is needed to come to, you know, um, electric um, aircraft and so on. Um, what's your take on it? Basically, um, I I don't really like the term green mobility because it puts the focus too much on one aspect of sustainability. And um, of course, um, yes, we we all have this huge challenge of making air travel, air mobility. Um, well, not zero carbon or ideally zero carbon, but low carbon. But we also need to make it um, uh, regard, uh, with regard to the noise. Uh, that's, that's, very, that's a very important issue for us being an airport operator. But of course, if we also look at, uh, we need to look at the social um, perspective. So, so aviation, and I'm talking about um, other or alternative forms of, of air mobility needs to be safe, it needs to be uh, really affordable for people. And of course, it needs to be socially accepted. And uh, when we talk about um, um, urban air mobility or a uh, advanced air mobility, of course, the huge challenge is to make a viable business for all the parties involved in this ecosystem. And I think this is a challenge that, that we don't see so far for, for all players. And, um, well, talking about sustainable aviation fuels, I think this is a very um, interesting technology, but it's not the holy grail. I think we, we, we must be sure about this because it's a bridge technology, bridging the time from today when we rely on fossil fuels, um, until the day when we really have um, commercially um, um, zero emission airlines flying around. Mm -hmm. And well, 2035 plus something, uh, that's a pretty long time. <laughs> so it's, it needs to be a stable bridge. And so far, if we stay in this picture, this bridge is way too expensive. It's, it's, we all know about the costs and um, I, I, we really uh, um, try to um, support our customers, our airlines, to provide them with SAF, but we also incorporate with um, partners uh, in industry, in research, acad uh, academia, to, to uh, leverage the supply, which will prospectively lower the price for SAF. Mm -hmm. I'll take you up quickly on the 2020, uh, 2035 um, uh, quote, um, and I would like to include everyone here in the audience. Um, whilst we continue the panel, there is, will be again a, a, a QR code. And what I'm interested in, and I would like then to also to um, see where if the audience thinks the same way as we do, um, but when do you think you will be boarding eVTOLs, so electric vertical landing and takeoff um, uh, vehicles? Uh, and you can basically, it's a, I think it's a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a question where you can type 2020, 20, uh, 2025, 2030, and so on. So let us know when you think you will be boarding um, EV tolls. Um, and uh, Thomas, um, lastly, what is your take on, on the aviation in the next 20 years? Yeah, well, I can, um, I'm fully with all the, 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 the topics that we heard already. Yeah. So sustainability is, of course, one of the biggest issues for us, also as the infrastructure provider for, um, I would say, classical aviation. But what I see is really this um, new kind of um, mobility coming up, using the third dimension and going into, into the lower airspace, where maybe it's even more complex also to really get all this traffic um, going very smoothly. 
Um, and I think that, that will be the major change in the next 20 years um, to, to set up all these uh, um, ecosystem parts that are needed to have a, a viable mobility offer for people coming from intercontinental flights maybe, but then needing to get to some location somewhere in the city. Infrastructure there is also a big problem, I think. Um, it's, it's maybe um, in, in Middle Europe it's, it's a special problem because of the, of the, the, the houses there are available there and the, the space very limited maybe in the city centers. So this is also something um, that will become more and more important. But also this uh, advanced air mobility in short, in, in short distances with the maybe electrified um, aircrafts. Also this is something that will definitely um, be on the part. Just two weeks ago I had the first, the first talk about uh, really someone trying to set up a business model with this. With small mm -hmm. electric aircrafts which are not on the market yet. So really um, thinking about business models to, to, to earn money with, uh, with this kind of uh, mobility offer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's talk about um, this. Let's talk about um, Worthy Ports and, and about your companies about it. I see that people are already expecting to board an EVTOL in 2020, 2030, like half of the, of the <coughs> audience. Um, Daniel is, is, is smiling a little bit. Um, Who's already talking about this at your company? Are you already considering this, um, EV tolls? Is this on your strategic radar? Um, do you say, hey, we have to uh, get behind this now, otherwise we you know, uh, might miss the train and, and are just running behind it? Uh, Anna, what about, what about Austrian Airlines? Do you, do you already talk about this internally, or is this still something we're saying, let's wait a little bit? Um, we, of course, do talk about it, and I think it fits very well into the business model of a network airline um, because we have a diversified fleet, um, we are operating different aircraft, um, and Austrian Airlines has, um, at this moment, around 15 destinations which are in the reach of 500 kilometers, um, so we have a network which would be very suitable for that. Um, but an example I, I always like to mention is um, that um, short haul flights account for only 4% of, of aviation's total emissions. Um, so it's only a fraction of what we have to focus on. Um, and I think it's um, also in terms of, of passenger capacity, it's, it's still pretty limited because our smallest aircraft, the, the Embraer, we are operating right now, it fits um, um, around 100 passengers, so that's a lot more than, than current uh, EV tolls on the market. Um, but I think also um, as a premium carrier, we have status clients, and this could be very interesting for a status client. So I just imagine a, a business uh, man or a business woman um, <coughs> traveling from Graz uh, with, a, with an EV toll and then landing directly in, in front of our 777 or fortunately a, a newer model then <laughs> in 2030 and just like having to go up the stairs and, and get into the business class seat that would be of course wonderful. So you could see um, EV tolls becoming also like an extension of your traditional business model for Austrian Airlines saying okay good we still operate obviously like um, long-haul flights, also the, the, the uh, mid-range flights or the short-haul flights, but it could also be something where we um, can potentially get in, get behind this and can also um, offer our clients uh, you know, an additional service, basically. Exactly. Next to intermodality products, we already have like, like Aero, the cooperation with, with UBB, um, because it would be much more suitable in terms of perfect time managing. Yeah. Intermodality, it's an interesting topic because I know that we all struggle with that. <laughs> it's, it's, it is super difficult to implement this and we work on this and, and I know uh, we had deal flows um, with, with you, Thomas, and with, Inter with the International Airport, with all of our other airports uh, and partners about how to integrate all the different means of moving around. So I think it's very interesting and we need to, we need to build for that. Um, Word deports infrastructure, Daniel. Um, I know that Munich Airport International is definitely one of the forerunners when it comes to you know collaborating um, and being involved in in infrastructure. 
How do you see, like, how, how do you see the involvement in that um, for Munich Airport? And can you tell us a little bit more maybe about um, uh, the recent uh, opening of uh, an, the first urban airport, right, in Coventry, where you were involved? Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's in Coventry. We visited it. It's a partner we, we, we collaborate with. It's, it was quite kind of interesting because you mentioned it, because it, it's the, the world's first demonstrator for a virtual port so far. Even I have only seen it on, on nice looking pictures, like, like a vertipod nicely sitting on top of a skyscraper. And um, it was just a typical visualization with not too much content in it. And it, it felt good to, to see and feel it, the dimensions and uh, how the processes might work. And this is, this is a, a very, very important um, uh, first first step to get an impression of how it looks like. But um, talking about vertiports, uh, this is only one building block of an ecosystem that we need to build. I mean, the ecosystem roughly consists of, well, the, the ground infrastructure, including the vertiport, of course, the eVTOLs, the flight operations, airspace man uh, or airspace integration, mm -hmm. and, um, well, of course, PNR, as a um, 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 uh, um, repair and maintenance, and of course the digital infrastructure, the customer inf interface. And this is why I welcome your statements, uh, Anna, that, uh, because I, I wish that, that uh, the airlines would be in the driver's seat when it comes to EVTOL operations, uh, simply because I, th I believe that a strong airline brand will help uh, gain public acceptance, and of course from an airports perspective, it is very important to have like um, network carriers integrate eVTOL uh, traffic in, 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 in the planning, in the network planning. And this helps us as well. We don't want a siloed and in isolated form of mobility. We want intermodality. And this is, I think, a very good way to go, having the, the, the airlines in the driver's seat. Andreas? Um you guys at FACC, you work very closely also with eHang. Um, where do you see the conversation at the moment? Uh, do you think that, um, that uh, there is already enough, like that people already talk about enough about you know, eVTOLs and that things are moving to the right direction? Or do you think things could get a, go, go a little bit quicker? Um, what's, what's your take on it? Well, I mean, to, to begin with, uh, one thing is very clear. EVTOLs are not going to make classical aviation greener, since this was the first question. It's basically a totally new market, and we have to treat these two topics differently. <clears throat> um, when it comes to us, um, as a company, we perceive here the same strategy as we do in the classical aviation. We work with many partners. Uh, we are not the OEM, but we help OEMs in being successful. And you're totally right. Um, we have been among the first movers globally here, um, especially from the supply chain, to go into that market with our partnership with eHang. But we have several collaborations ongoing right now, and I think a very good and broad overview in this segment. Um, to get back to your questions, you know, we need to be aware that the innovation in eVTOLs is not lying in the way how we bring people or also cargo from A to B. We have it since decades, and it's called helicopter. Why do helicopters not scale? There are many reasons, like noise, but above all, it's affordability. A helicopter is super expensive when it comes to uh, CAPEX, but also when it comes to OPEX. And the innovation with eVTOLs is not just to make them greener, not ju just to make the aircraft less noisy, but also to make them affordable for a wide range of people. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think speaking about the use cases, of course, the transport from the airport to city centers, other mobility hubs, for executives, for uh, people with a senator or an on status. Um, of course, it, it can be seen as, as, a solution for, as a solution for that, or as an initial use case. But frankly speaking, do these people really need eVTOLs? They can also take a helicopter. If you, if you look at cities like Sao Paulo, you have 500 helicopters flying around there each day. If you go to New York JFK, on a good day with plate, you can fly for 120 US dollars uh, into the city center. Um, you don't need eVTOLs for that. And if it's just a green helicopter at the end of the day, then these products will not succeed. So you have to look at it from a totally different angle. At the end of the day, it's a mix of aviation, automotive industry, and public transport. So um, the, 
the key for eVTOLs is lying in affordability mm -hmm. and in mass commuting. And if you think about the question how and why do new technologies and disruptive innovations succeed, because they solve a problem, in the best case, a fundamental need. And what do eVTOLs solve? They solve the problem of commuting, they solve the problem of traffic jams, they give us back the most valuable currency uh, people are striving for in the 21st century. What is their time? They can spend for different things than spending in traffic jams. And at the same time, this desire for being mobile is getting more and more and more. And if you think about the technology, what enables distance to get relative, what is this going to change? Imagine you can fly for um, a few a dozen euros uh, to, to, to from Vienna, uh, just, just to, the, to the seaside in Italy. Um, you jump into the, in the sea, uh, you have a coffee and you fly back. Or imagine uh, you don't have to decide anymore if you, um, if you buy or build a house uh, in the rural countryside for much less money or for the same money where you get a 50 square meter apartment in the city center because you just go there because the jobs are there. So if distance gets relative and you have a technology being able to offer that, I think we don't have to discuss further if this is going to succeed or not. At the end of the day, this technology and eVTOLs are the beginning of the old dream of mankind of the flying car. And we speak about that since decades. Um, why didn't it come true in the past? Because the technology was not there. Mm -hmm. Today we have the underlying technologies, at least in an early and sometimes also mature state. In software, in artificial intelligence, in lightweight mass manufacturing, also in uh, electrical engines. And uh, um, I always like to compare the state of the industry uh, with the automotive industry in the 1920s. I think the eVTOL industry, the urban air industry, the advanced air industry, however you want to call it, and also this not or this unclarity on terminology shows how early stage it is. Um, but I think this is a very good comparison. And if you would have told somebody in the 1920s that millions of concretes will be full uh, for parking places, or millions of square meters will be full with concrete for parking places and billions of cars driving around, every would have said, you're damn crazy, we have horse carriages, we don't need that. And it's the same here. So do I believe that's coming? 100%. There's a tick in the box. Too much money, too many companies, uh, too much focus on this. What we do not know at this stage, when it's coming exactly, where is it coming exactly, and how big is it going to be? Thomas, flying cars um, at Vienna International Airport. Um, <laughs> we don't have currently. We don't, you don't have currently, but like in the future, do you see that as, as an airport? Do you see airports in... When we're, when we're going to get there, you know, when everything gets closer together, we can commute. Um, we use this as an actual transportation method. Do you see airports as, um, as a full service provider or just an infrastructure provider? Somewhere in between, I would say. Um, pure infrastructure is, is, is not even now our, our business. Yeah. So we are always looking into um, extending our services into, into uh, feasible um, directions, <coughs> together with other partners on, uh, of the ecosystem, of course. So I think what we as an airport really can do very good is um, operate um, um, this um, interface from, from ground to, to air um, mobility. So this is one asset I think we have as an airport. And I, th I think this is still valid also in the future, uh, especially if you have these, uh, these connections to intercontinental flights, um, something like that. There will be, there will be services from, from, from airlines, but also from the airports um, that need um, a lot of, I would say, expertise um, to do this smoothly. Um, flow management in the terminals and to, the, to the aircrafts, this is something we do uh, every day mm -hmm. and uh, are still uh, optimizing. Um, and I think this is a crucial part for the future, for the customer experience. So no, not only infrastructure, also um, um, services. Yeah. Talking about customer experience, I, I imagine um, that uh, luggage will be a problem as well in the future, probably, for, with the first, with the first um, uh, EV tools, maybe. Um, where do you see solutions for that? Because I, I'm, I mean, 
can this be like is this a, is this a space where startups can come in? Um, I know that that you already um, uh, are working with a with a startup called uh, Airporter, um, doing like end to end luggage handling. Um, do you see do you see that um, as a as a needed part to you know get people um, on EV tolls so that it's not that cumbersome? Because if I if I if I arrive with um, with Austrian Airlines from my from my holiday in Bangkok. Um, I might have two big bags with me, and then I either have to, to, to decide, okay, one more person or one luggage next to me in the EV toll. <laughs> so uh, I think, um, are these services going to be um, more, import more and more important? Um, and this maybe, a, a, a C I see we only have a few minutes left. Um, uh, yeah, a question um, to uh, Thomas, um, but also Andreas, and I would also like to know uh, um, from, from you, Anna, um, if you're already thinking about, you know, um, Integrating kind of such services um, into into your customer experience. So maybe, um, uh, what do you think, Thomas, about the technology and startups who could come into this? Is this something that um, you see in the future? Definitely, I, I think that there needs to be new service offers with new ideas and also new technologies in place, um, because also of the convenience for the passenger. So best would be for every passenger to leave the the, the luggage. Uh, somewhere very quickly near the hotel or uh, at the yeah. home um, and uh, getting it back um, it perfectly uh, seated in the, in the hotel room where I go to and same the other way around. So there is definitely a need for something yeah. like that. Anna, do you see uh, passengers already um, asking for services like this? Um, actually, we're facing that problem already because with our aerial product, um, one of the biggest issues for our passengers is that they have their luggage with them until Vienna Airport where they can drop it off. Um, so the, the solutions we are looking into now to, to have a direct drop off in the train, it is a huge, huge hurdle because there's safety standards. Um, people from UBB need to be trained for that. So I think there's definitely a lot of room for innovative ideas to step mm -hmm. in, how to simplify those, those processes. Okay, so, so all the players are coming together to solve this issue. Andreas, do I have to um, decide in the future whether I want to have a, a luggage with me or um, my girlfriend sitting next to me in the, in the, in the, uh, in the drone? No, for sure not. Um, that's basically something very easy to solve and most of the vehicles being um, in development right now also foresee already a luggage. I think the biggest problem is not here lying in the aircraft, but how you integrate it into the airport processes. I mean, speaking about custom experience in a market where not even a single eVTOL is fully certified is a very high ambition. Um, one thing I do know, uh, to be a bit more general, I think the custom experience for the passenger has to be more on the side of a tram station or a subway station than like on a classical airport. Otherwise, you will lose all the time advantage you gain on the flight in the process of boarding. Um, and and uh, this also uh, shows a bit uh, how this topic should be perceived. I mean, what I said before, um, the first use case will not, speaking again about the flying car, that uh, the end consumer is buying an eVTOL, uh, put it at home on the garage, and everybody flies around uh, like, like he or she endeavors. That might be uh, happening, uh, and my grand-grandchildren uh, will experience it, um, but not our generation. Uh, what we will have as an initial operations is an operator-based model. So you have several starting and landing points, um, could be airports, but could be also a lot of small airports, more or less leveraged mobility centers we have today, like tram stations, like big bus stations, like subways. It's more about quantity in my point of view than uh, quality of a few single uh, vertiport infrastructures. Um, and then you have an operator operating that. Um, so for the end consumer, it's a mix of bus line with fixed stations, but also individual character of a taxi service because you can decide from which station to which station you want to go. So consider it more as a tram or as a, as a uh, cable car without cable in the beginning. Yeah? Okay. Um, but still uh, being very, very useful to improve our daily lives. Perfect. I mean, I, I love the fact that we are all sitting here to, uh, today, that airports are sitting here, airlines are sitting here, um, and also um, you guys as um, the, the um, basically who are also responsible very deep in the supply chain of all these things. We built this stuff. Talk, yeah, you built this stuff, talking about this. And um, I, for the end, um, I would like to have a quick statement from everyone, like a call to action or what is needed going forward from your end or what you, what you think you will be heading in the next few years. So, um, 
and a call to action from Austrian Airlines when it comes to eVTOLs? <laughs> Um, call to action is simplify processes and really work together because um, the dream is just for a traveler to go onto one app and and to only have to use this app or or, or platform from leaving your your door until um, entering the hotel door. So that's I think the goal okay. we should aim for. So Austria is all about simplifying the experience for the customer. So that's a super smooth, friends. Daniel. Well, um, talking about eVTOLs, I think, yes, we all agree it's a huge, interesting technology. It's a huge market that is evolving. It gives uh, the customer huge opportunities. But we want to make it real. Mm. And my message is let's just take the magic out of it. It's not rocket science. It's a job to be done. Let professionals support you to, to guide you through this this, this journey. And uh, I mean, um, planning and setting up and operating an airport, this is a hugely complex issue. And um, we adapt our knowledge and transfer it to this new market. And to be honest, we, we don't know everything. Of course not. We are learning every day uh, with, with our research partners, with, with, with our customers. But uh, yes, it's, it's, it's a step-by-step -step approach, and in the end, I think it will be a very successful new market with huge opportunities. So let's take the magic out of this and say, hey, we need to act. We need to start you know, um, acting now, um, because it's a long process um, for everyone involved to have um, a, an operating system in the end. Exactly. Slice, slice the elephant step-by-step-by-step. Yeah. By step by step. It's a very, very simple approach if you have enough, if you have like the, the eagle view. Okay, so basically every, I think maybe something could be that every airport says like, okay, let's just, you know, start with a test um, um, vertiport, for example, and see how, how, we can, how we can operate on that. Well, basically I was thinking about uh, traffic forecast, location analysis, business model, and so on. It's like a roughly a 10-step okay. approach that, that we are currently developing, and we are... Um, actually doing this at Munich Airport, because we're, we're, we're uh, having a feasibility study of having an airport, uh, a vertiport at Munich Airport, but we're also working with partners globally who are, who are much, much keener on having this new way of mobility than we do have in Germany. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, hard to, to, to add something. Um, maybe one little little thing from an airport pers perspective. Um, we really um, need to have uh, an integrated view on, on this whole thing. So there is this air taxi thing, which is maybe fully independent of an, of an airport. And there is this integration with airports with other aviation things. So we are very actively monitoring. We are also talking to, to a lot of stakeholders in the, in the industry. Um, but to be, to be honest, uh, we are not engaging like the Munich, Munich does currently, um, but that might change in the, in the near future. Yeah. Perfect. So you should definitely talk at the buffet afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a great fan of collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Andreas, um, uh, the last uh, few seconds, uh, what's your call to action? Three, three short things. First of all, more international cooperation. We see totally different paces internationally, and there is no global ecosystem, no global standards, no global conversation ongoing. Not in between the industry, not in between the regulators. So everybody is trying uh, to discover this uh, new territory independently, what might be a mistake mm -hmm. um, for all of us. Uh, second thing is, fully agree, slice it in pieces. Don't make it too complicated or don't make it more complicated than it is and start with what you have and what you can do. For example, um, why do you need to think about sophisticated vertiport infrastructures when you use eVTOLs for tourism in a rural area? You, you don't even need a concrete parking place. You just land on the grass, you get my point, and fly people around. Of course, considering that the eVTOLs are certified, but that's going to be the first step, and, uh, not any longer the most complicated one, frankly speaking. Um, and the third part is, as an aviation industry, um, we need to get rid of our um, pure aviation glasses, how we look on that topic, you know. Yes, it is partly aviation, but it's not only aviation. And we cannot compare a vertiport with a large-scale airport of the legacy aviation, and we cannot compare an eVTOL with an Airbus A320. 
Um, so we need to, of course, we sh must not, and there is, there is no compromise on security, 100% degree. If you compromise on security in aviation, you are done, and nobody will do that. Um, but from, from, as, as a mean of transport, we need to bring elements in of the automotive industry, of the public transport, of taxi services, of platform and uh, digital economy and uh, uh, shared economy. And that's basically it. Awesome. Thank you so much. There is, um, yeah, let's, let's work on this <laughs> together in small pieces, small steps. Um, Anna, thank you so much for joining me. Daniel, thank you very much also for flying in. Um, Thomas, thank you. And also Andreas, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you very much.